Hi, I'm James Wise, and welcome to What's Next, a video series interviewing the founders of some of the most exciting technology companies today. Today, we're talking to Benjamina Balag, the founder and CEO of Uncommon, a business on a mission not just to change what we eat, but also the way that therapeutics are developed as well. Today, we're talking about everything from finding that first scientific co-founder, the challenges of fixing supply chains and finding lab space, through to some of the biggest changes in the way we eat and live that are coming down the pipeline over the next 20 to 30 years. Benjamina, thank you so much for joining us on What's Next. Thank you for having me. Um, Look, it's great to have you here. Um, You know, in this interview series, we've been talking to a lot of people working in really challenging deep tech companies. on problems which they hope have societal and world impact, but actually on quite niche areas of technology, so automating wet labs or drug discovery. Um, But you're working on something which I think is fundamentally of interest to all of us, food. Uh, You have an 8 billion market out there, basically everyone on the planet. Um, And so it's incredibly exciting to hear about not just the technologies that have changed over the last 20 years that allow you to do what you do, but also what the future of food is looking like, because I think that's of interest to all of us. But maybe we should start with what Uncommon is doing today. So our mission is really to be the greatest enablers of um, a healthier world. And that started with a broad mission, which for me was to do something around people's health and starting with being brought up really with health at the center of everything. And um, my dad always saying, well, if you're not healthy, nothing else matters. And then we refined um, this more into, well, where can we have the biggest impact? And that is through cultivated meat. So the way it works, um, for those of you who don't know, is to make um, to take a small sample of cells, which we grow, and then turn into muscle and fat, and then we mix it with, as well, different um, proteins and fats to make cultivated meat, and in our case, bacon um, as a first product. But actually, now we've broadened um, that, and we've realized that some of our technologies have wider impacts, and that's why we've we've looked at the mission being broader and being an enabler of a healthier world, um, because we do it through food, but we're also looking at um, broader applications in therapeutics and, and others. And we'll go into uh, some of the technical breakthroughs that you know, have enabled you to do this and that you're working on yourself. But if successful, if Uncommon works and companies like Uncommon work um, in being able to change the, the way we fabricate food and therapeutics, what changes? Like, What does the world look like in 10 years' time should this technology be successful? So on the cultivated meat side, we actually hope not much will change from a surface perspective. Um, So actually going to the supermarkets, you'll have meat that look really pretty much the same. The process of making them will be better. Um, Similarly, I mean, we hope there's not going to be 10 times more hurricanes, um, 10 times more wild forests, you know, um, or, or a lot more respiratory diseases. We hope that things actually either improve in that there's less threats from a climate perspective, um, but also hopefully at least don't become worse. Yeah. And do you want to unpack that a little bit more? So that connection between what you're working on in cultivated meat and sort of the climate challenge? Yeah. So cultivated meat uses a lot lot less water, a lot less um, land, and that enables also to do better things with that land, um, as well as a lot less um, carbon emissions. Another big one is antibiotics. And that's one of the reasons we chose pork is we don't use any antibiotics, whereas traditionally meat uses a lot of antibiotics. For example, um, there's as many uh, medically important antibiotics that are used on pigs and on humans in the US. Um, So it's really important that we we remove that versus, you know, sometimes people um, say, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm I'm ill, I'm not going to use that antibiotic. That's still important to do, but a lot of it is also in our diet. So when you talk about the spread of respiratory disease, for example, and other diseases, actually that can be accelerated by the wide-scale use of antibiotics in in animal. So that was more actually around climate. Um, So climate change will will cause a lot more respiratory diseases. Because of the change in the atmosphere. Yeah. And when we talk about, um, you know, obviously your focus on on pork today uh, and the the reasons for doing that, where did this idea come from? Where did this idea start? And how long have you been thinking about changing the way that we create meat? So I've been working on this idea since late 2017. 
um, started it while I was in an accelerator called Entrepreneur First. Um, someone introduced me to the concept. The concept's been around since the 1970s. I think the first patents are in the 1980s on, on cultivated meat. So for me, it's a bit like a Venn diagram. It's where can I have the biggest impact on what I wanted to have an impact on, which is people's health. Um, but also, what am I good at and what do I enjoy doing in an everyday? Because um, there are a lot of things that can have an impact on people's health, but not necessarily everywhere I'm the best person to to lead that or I would enjoy the everyday of it. And, and Cultivated Reed really brought, brought all of that um, together, so had the impact and also um, enjoy the pretty much every day. <laughs> yeah, and it's because before this, you know, you ha you have a, a master's uh, in engineering from uh, Imperial, which is a phenomenal institution. And before this, you were working, I believe, in, in an electronics business. Yeah, after my studies, but before this, so I did a small uh, a small company. Um, we were actually doing mostly kind of um, sales and and marketing. So we weren't doing the electronics. We found a manufacturers, but that was a very good way of learning. I think the biggest learning was that resilience is everything. And that's something that I've really brought with me. It's what got me, I believe, in, in the program in Entrepreneur First. And I think what got us to where, where we are today. And so as a starting point, you found Entrepreneur First in particular is a, a really important first step on your, your journey towards founding Uncommon. I think it helped me a lot with understanding venture-backed companies. Um, I think there wasn't a lot of deep tech founders or, well, one, there was essentially one biologist in the whole court. So I wasn't able to find um, my, my co-founder within that. So I then had to go and, and look in, in the wider, wider world and how to find the best co-founder. It took, it took me some time. I took the lessons from it. Um, and I was lucky that uh, my current co-founder, Ruth, um, originally joined me as, as a senior stem cell scientist. Um, and then moved into becoming my co-founder and the chief scientific officer. So she she brings the biological expertise, and she has a PhD, three postdocs, and and all from you know Oxford. So not not too bad. Yeah, and uh, well, I don't want to bring any university bias in here. But it's obviously a very good university. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about, about that process of finding a scientific co-founder because? It's a really interesting dynamic and a difference, I think, sometimes between more traditional software businesses and hard tech businesses. Just naturally, the skills that you need in the founding team are a lot more niche and a lot more novel, right? Lots of these times you're working with people on technologies that don't exist yet. So how do you go about finding that person? How did you find your Ruth? I made lots of mistakes and I think I actually um, got really lucky that Ruth found us and she, she applied. Um, so I made lots of mistakes. Um, but I think one of the, the critical things that I, I didn't necessarily see in Ruth, but if I was to ever do it when at the interview process and turned out to be one of the key, most important things. And if I was to do it again, um, would really look for is that kind of drive and resilience and just creativity of pro around problem solving. So, you know, Ruth's been incredible. We were at some point, we had seven pounds in the bank account. I told Ruth, I can guarantee you a month, but I don't know <laughs> if I can do much more. Um, and she had her own personal situation and still really stuck by it. And I think you want to test people that will do that, that will be there from the hard times. And if you're at the top and collapsing, they'll be right next to you. And yes, there's a lot of people that have, um, have PhDs and have all those technical skills, but I think the founder characteristics actually are similar across whether it's software or, or, you know, or deep tech, and you should be looking really and testing that. And even more with the deep tech, that is a long time frame. Mm. And I mean, there's just so many points of both jubilation and failure <laughs> in the scientific process, right? I guess you just have to find someone who can exactly. um, be as resilient as you are. Uh, when you're exactly. going through that, so so you you did entrepreneur first, which is a great program, but you didn't necessarily find your 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 perfect co-founder through that. What were the next steps from you know spending a few months on that program to finding the funding to get you know, the rest of the team in place and, and and the project up and running? 
It was a long process and that's where resilience was key. Um, I think we reached out to, I don't know, eight, 800 or something investors. Um, so we really, we, we went, you know, we would go broad and then narrow. We would go through, you know, individuals, funds, and we went through many, many iterations. Um, we, we ended up actually for the seed round. So we had a few angel investors that were interested. Um, but we didn't really have a lead, but we were we were looking already to bringing bringing them on. Um, and at the time applied, so Sam Altman had put a tweet about starting a fund with his brothers um, and wanting to invest in deep tech. So it was a similar process than Y Combinator. Um, and we applied to that and went through numerous rounds of kind of uh, due diligence and they ended up investing, which then made it a hell of a lot easier to um, attract more more capital. Yeah. I mean, I, I do describe venture capital sometimes as the process of exhausting all the no's. And I go <laughs> and find all of the no's out there, get through all of them, and eventually you'll get to the yes. Um, yeah. But I think a fantastic first founder um, fund. Um, when you think about that process, because you know, obviously this, is a, this podcast is for everyone, but we're based here in London. Did you um, were you surprised that it was a US fund that sort of helped lead your initial seed round? I mean, you, US has kind of historically been more open to deep tech and have a, have a bigger risk appetite. Um, I think it depends. It depends the fund. Um, and and actually, I've been I've been presently surprised at at Series A by by funds like Balderton um, that invested in our, our our Series A that are more generalist. Um, and I think you you still really get deep tech and have that long term view. So I don't necessarily think it's U.S. versus um, versus Europe. I think the amount of funds that are willing to take risk is just simply larger and there are just more funds um, in the US as well. And that process of navigating fundraising from sort of deep tech specialists, people who may have you know, PhD researchers full-time on their investment committees or people who just have a, a very narrow focus on what they invest in and that, that more generalist VC, like as Balderton is, right? We've been investing for 24 years. We've had to shift uh, with the focus of the times. Did you have to go through that with different pitch decks? Did you offer people different milestones? Were there different types of conversations that you had to have to navigate those different types of investors? Not necessarily. So um, I was actually pleasantly surprised by some of the questions um, that, that you know, Balderton asked us during the, the due diligence process. Um, and they were actually very, very thoughtful and they were the right questions. Sometimes specialists would go into too much of details that didn't necessarily matter. Um, but there were some funds also that didn't necessarily ask the, the right questions or too broad of questions. So I think it wasn't necessarily a category, but more, again, the quality and of the fund mm -hmm. itself. And in your fundraising process, because we see this a lot with deep technology companies, did you explore sort of government support or you know, obviously you're working on something which has a broad range of benefits, as you've mentioned, like did you talk to impact funds, people who are perhaps less commercial and more interested in just pushing the science forward? I think impact funds also want returns. Um, we applied to government in the beginning. We ended up, I think, getting about 30K or so in uh, advice, <laughs> um, oh, wow, which okay. didn't help much. Um, but actually, government came came quite helpful in the in-between. So once we did a seed round, we ended up doing a seed extension where we got an Innovate UK grant, uh, where we got a million um, out of it. So th that was really good, actually, in getting more investment. So we found government really helpful in accelerating things. I think that there's a lot of um, suspicion about government uh, investment and perhaps it doesn't necessarily get the credit it deserves for the amount of uh, capital that gets deployed into hard tech companies. So I'm glad that you got some uh, positive outcome from it. And obviously- we're working on getting more. <laughs> and you're working on getting more, good. Well, I, look, I think it's an incredibly important mission you're on. So if it can be matched with private money and help build a business, I think that's a great outcome for everyone. Um, when you think about the the team you've built, then since that right, you've you've been through this process, you've raised some money, you've got your co-founder uh, and and sort of early team in place. How do you think about the kind of skills that you're optimizing for now? Is it still resilience first, or 
are you having to look at bringing in far more niche skills and backgrounds? It's both. Um, and that's why in the interview process, we actually separate the technical um, interviews and also culture fit interviews, and both are as important. Um, so if someone fails the culture fit interview, they will also not get the, the role. Um, so we really have to do both, but you do need expertise, right? Um, I don't necessarily think the founders themselves have to come from um, many years of PhD, uh, you know, of PhD and postdocs. Um, I don't necessarily think actually it's PhD and postdocs and it has to be academic, um, but I do really believe that you need expertise around you and you need a mixture um, of, of people with different expertise. And with us, we, we need really a broad range, right? We need, uh, stem cell scientists. We need food scientists. Um, we need people on the marketing side. Um, soon we're going to start needing sales. Um, we're looking at more, bringing more automation. So it's really a broad range of, of skills we need. Mm. And I think that's a really important point and something which, uh, you know, I get a lot of inbound, from people who are looking for roles in technology companies where they want to feel passionate about the product and the mission they're on as much as they want you know, a good business and a, and a financial return. Obviously, you're on that mission. So you must get a lot of inbound from people who are just w want to be part of your journey. So I guess the good news for them is you don't need a scientific background necessarily to have an impact at a company like Uncommon. Exactly. I think it depends, right? You can't put a recent graduate or a business, you know, a business person in a stem cell scientist role. I think as we expand, um, we'll have more as well of the business roles. I think at the moment it is still highly scientific, right? If we look at our organization, the majority of our organizations are um, stem cell scientists, um, biomaterial scientists, engineers. Um, but as we grow, we need of everything. And if you're really, really good, you might be, um, for example, on the marketing, we have one person. Um, but if you're you're the best marketing person in the world, you will be that one person within the company, right? Mm. That will drive it. Yeah. And it, it, look, it is incredibly important as well, right? I mean, getting that message out about what you're building, exactly. building excitement about the product. And we spoke there about the importance of branding and bringing people along with you on this journey. Uh, but you've actually recently rebranded, right? I think when we first met, you were higher stakes. Uh, now the company is called Uncommon. Um, why did you make that decision after putting all that effort, obviously, into, into higher stakes initially? So the first thing is higher stakes. Um, didn't. It was great for the beginning. It was memorable. It was catchy. But the first thing is we we're not making stakes. Um, so we thought it would confuse the consumers. And the other thing is Uncommon enables us to be broader on the health. So yes, we can focus on Uncommon bacon, um, but actually Uncommon is more about that mindset and um, yeah, thinking from first principles and doing things that have a huge impact, which is I think what this podcast as well is about. Yeah. I actually remember in the investment memo uh, I read about higher stakes at the time, there was a photo, which is very rare in an investment <laughs> memo. They're normally very dry documents. There's a photo of Daniel looking um, uh, very happy with trying out some of your bacon and smiling massively uh, and basically going, mmm, uh, which I think works quite well with the uncommon. Exactly. So we have all the M's multiplying, but that's also cells multiplying. So we can, um, we can work on, yeah, the waves of done the the bacon as well as the mm and and many aspects <laughs> i think it's really good what are the milestones for the business now like what are the things that you're hoping to achieve and you're rallying your team around in the 12 months to come so for us it's really around um getting closer to commercialization so Unsurprisingly, getting the cost down, getting the scale up, um, improving as well on the taste, nutrition, um, but also we're exploring different avenues. So we're looking at partnerships to make more out of our technology, as I mentioned, on the biotech side. And this technology has been around for a while, right? People have been working on um uh, cultivated meat for for decades, and even the idea of it—you know—think about the you know, the really high-level science fiction stuff. You know, the Star Trek um, <laughs> machine where you can just say, "Hey, I want a bacon sandwich," and it's there in front of you. So the idea of it's been around a long time. The technology, or at least the people have been working on it for a long time. What's changed over the last couple of decades, which mean that this is now possible commercially? That actually there is a chance that you can get uh, cultivated meat to a price point, which means that we wouldn't 
recognize the difference if you went to the supermarket. I think a lot has changed in the consumer perspective. The fact that actually people might think, oh, there's a lot of competition, but I think the fact that there's a lot of companies working on it makes governments and suppliers pay more attention to it. Um, uh, another thing is also the discoveries that have happened in um, the biotech field. So for example, the cells that we're using only were discovered in the early 2000s and got a Nobel Prize in 2012. Um, so we wouldn't have been able to use those type of cells that we're using and, and that technology had we started you know, um, 50, uh, 50 years ago. Another thing is we use our mRNA technology um, and there's a lot more work going on around that and a lot more movement that, again, um, we're also leveraging to get the cost down, to improve the efficiencies, um, and yeah, and it makes it easier. So there's, there's been this convergence of sort of cultural acceptance, of awareness at least, um, regulatory support and you know, technological breakthroughs in other fields. Um, did you foresee all this? Is this was this part of the plan that this these tailwinds were in place when you set out on this journey? Um, and you know, if so, what's actually surprised you about the challenges to scaling? What's been the the things which have come up, which have meant actually building this business has been harder than you thought it would be? So I think I I did I I expected actually probably. Uh, um, naively for it to happen faster. Um, and, and I think as an industry, sometimes we underestimated actually how long things will take. And if you look back in time, you know, we have, oh, in 2021, we'll all be on the market sending millions. And I think we've sometimes been too optimistic um, as, as an industry. And sometimes the devil's in, in the details. So some of the things that I found surprising um, is how much you know a problem in supply chain um, can delay you for months, um, how difficult it is to set up your own facilities. Um, a lot of those challenges that maybe you you underestimate and um, when when you set up. And again, that's why it's also important to have experienced people around you that help you navigate that. And on the regulatory side, so what's your experience been of working with government, working with policymakers, and discussing this with, I guess, people who represent the public, because ultimately it's phenomenal that you're building this new technology around food, but food is so important and you know so uh, potentially advantageous, but also changes to it could be dangerous as well. So it's rightly a regulated industry. How have you navigated that world? So we brought one of the best experts on, on our team, um, so we work with a regulatory specialist that has brought over 100 um, products through novel food regulations. And our experience has overall been good. I think the UK is really making an effort. Um, that doesn't mean there's no points of improvement, of course. Um, we, we hope that it stays essentially as strict to avoid, um, to avoid essentially bad players, but goes faster. So if they had the right resources that they can assess things and have a higher, um, yeah, a higher speed of assessing the dossiers that would make, I think, the better. Yeah. More money for regulators. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're pitching at the moment to get more money, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, look I, look, I think it's amazing you're here in the UK, right? Did you expect that you would be able to start in the UK as a market? Was that something that you always thought, well, this is the right place to start? Or have you ever considered the fact that, you know, if the regulatory environment changes, you may have to move the business? Um, so we don't necessarily have to place the business from an R&D perspective where we'll launch and we're still considering um, different locations. So we're going to be applying to novel um, to regulatory approval um, in multiple geographies and we'll see which one comes first. So we have as targets really US and UK um, as principal ones. Um, but our R&D is, is really here and, and here to stay. And we hope as well um, that we can scale up here. So we're, we're in talks to, to really look to accelerate that. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of frustrating and, and perhaps surprising to people that the bottlenecks for pushing forward this technology are not the fundamental science, right? It's not actually anymore the zero to one of you know the, the specific cells that you need to develop. It's things like getting the right regulatory approval and getting access to labs and getting the supply chain right, which all feel like things we, we should be able to solve, right? And, and to some extent, I guess, are outside of your control to some degree as a founder. Yeah, I think there's still some engineering challenge. Mm. Don't like, don't get me wrong. And I think there's also there will be new surprises, right? So we can try and predict what we want and look at different industries. But 
when, if you think about it, if you make, you know, um, chips, you know, in, in your kitchen, it's one thing to make all the chips for McDonald's is a different thing, right? Yeah. Um, and so if you think about the complexity of the process um, that we're doing, inevitably there's going to be unknown unknowns when when we scale it up that we're going to have to come through um, from both a majority and engineering perspective more than scientific, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> and, um, you know, you have, uh, you've mentioned already when you, when you joined EF, which is a great program and attracts a lot of talent. You probably, you struggled initially to find a biologist you could work with and working in any technology field is hard, but especially in hard tech, I feel there's even fewer entrepreneurs in different locations to build the relationships and, and community around. How have you found that part of being an entrepreneur in the hard tech space? Have you managed to build a, a support network or have managed to found a group of people who are going through these similar challenges, thinking about the engineering and scaling challenge, thinking about the chemistry and biology challenge, thinking about the supply chain challenges? I think it's become easier and easier um, to find people in deep tech. And actually with the market being harder, um, I think founders are actually more open to, to collaborating, to sharing um, the hard things that they're going through. I mean, even in Cultivated Meats, for example, we all met in, in 2018, um, but realized until this year, actually, we didn't bother all sitting in a room and seeing how can we push things together. Um, so there's a lot, a lot more momentum from that perspective. Um, I think on the other side, so for example, we have um, the the CEO forum that Valdetan um, enables where I'm with a mix of completely different entrepreneurs. And what I found surprising is actually a lot of the biggest headaches <laughs> are the same. Um, so yes, I might be annoyed that, you know, our bioreactor isn't working and um, there there's different details of it, but a lot of the big challenges of scaling a business are are similar and and that helps. Yeah. I mean, it's something we've, we've thought about a lot is you know, when we look to invest, right, we want to invest in phenomenal entrepreneurs and we want to invest in category defining businesses. Um, but obviously we want to invest in markets we also understand. Mm -hmm. And so when we thought about investing in those deeper technology um, companies like Uncommon and others in markets, which we haven't invested in before, like Cultivated Meat, we ask ourselves, what's the value we add? What's the value we bring here, right? We want to be more than just capital. And I think that community is part of the value. And it's amazing coming to, you know, obviously a lot of these CEO forums are actually private, but coming to some of the dinners and meetups where I am allowed <laughs> to come along, um, hearing the shared stories and challenges and uh, solutions between entrepreneurs working on you know, everything from sort of mobile apps through to logistics networks through to Cultivator Meet is kind of uh, a really interesting experience. And I'm glad that you, you, you're finding it useful. And how do you navigate that challenge personally? Right, you are you're building a business with all of these different dimensions moving around. There's a macro challenge, whether that's the funding environment, the regulatory environment, just public perception that you have to navigate as well. Um, and then you've just got you know all of the normal team challenges. How do you manage those different stresses and, and pressures? Interestingly, got asked that question by a team member this morning. It's oh, really? like, <laughs> you know, you, you work a hell of a lot and you think uh, <laughs> you're going to be doing this for long. Um, and I mean, I hope that I can run this business and scale with this business for the remaining of my, of my career. And to do that, if you're really looking at the long term, yes, there are weeks where you'll be working, you know, 16, 18 hours a day. And there's weeks where you really have to um, to push like crazy, but you need to also know to have some um, some sustainability around it. And I think um, so. Last year, I did a well-founded program that um, that you sponsored, and I think that that really helped me understand. Okay, actually, in in those crazy weeks, I want to make sure that I leave my phone out of my room, that I still exercise and. And yes, sometimes maybe I'll, I'll work that extra hours, but um, actually someone on, on that program told me, um, one of the coaches told me, you can, you can have it all, but not all at the same time. So it's, it's knowing which are the things you can drop when. Mm. And balancing that. That's exactly. sort of those various things rather than sort of letting them overcome you, I think. Is exactly. Sort of, and the well-founded program, you know, I think has set out to help people be be the best that they possibly can be in their game, right? It's not there. I think there's, there's a really interesting um, discussion going on around 
being a founder and building a business at the moment is like, you know, don't burn out. So, you know, take a step back. And, and the whole point of the Well Founder program is to say, you, you sh- if you're steady over time, you'll never burn out and still perform excellently. A bit like an athlete, right? The, the, the best athletes in the world, they don't sprint their PBs every single day. Um, what they do is they build up consistency and uh, resilience and their abilities over time so that when the starting gun <laughs> fires, they really can hit that PB. So hopefully that's, um, and it sounds like it's been helping you as an entrepreneur as well. Well, we founders, you know, hopefully we'll be doing it for a lot longer. Um, mm-hmm. So athletes, a lot of them, you know, at, at 50, 60, they're not doing it yes. anymore, yeah, right? Yeah. And and you see founders at, at 50, 60 still doing it. So actually... It's even if it's even more important to to know how to balance that, I think. And again, that doesn't mean you do a nine to five. I think there's no good founder that doesn't work crazy hours. Um, but it's finding a way to make the healthy hab- to have the healthy hab- habits um, within that. Mm. And um, maybe focusing then on the slightly more near term impacts, right? Obviously, I want you to be working on this in, in your fifties <laughs> and sixties if you're still enjoying it and having the impact you want. And the more near term. When are we going to be able to try cultivated meats and go down to the supermarket and pick it up? And at what point will my bacon sandwiches, should I so choose, uh, be uncommon bacon? Well, you can come and taste the <laughs> <laughs> the, the bacon uh, tomorrow if you want, yeah. um, but not but not everyone can, right? Um, I think when it comes to supermarkets and having it in to a point where we're actually the supply is really present. Um, we're probably talking three to five years to really have it in the supermarket on, you know, in, in large, large quantities, because a lot of, some people are starting to build those huge 200,000 square foot facilities. Mm-hmm. And those will take probably at least two, two years to get up and running. And the next products after bacon, how do you think about that product roadmap? What can you share? Yeah, so we're actually looking to stay within pork for a long time. Um, and that ana- allows us to collaborate with others when it comes to beef or chicken or other species um, more easily. Um, pork is a 400 billion market, so there's plenty that we can do with it. Um, in terms of next products, we're thinking about pork belly, where we already have prototypes, um, but also sausages um, and um, ham and yeah. And on that journey, you you will naturally come across naysayers and um, also just people who completely understandably say, well, you know, I like my bacon the way it is. I like my pork belly the way it is. How um, do you think you have to navigate those kind of conversations? What do you say to the potential consumers in two or three years time about the choice of an uncommon pork belly versus the pork belly they already get from their restaurant? So there's two things. Um, I think the first thing is to address their fears. Um, the biggest fear we found with consumers is safety. Um, so doing the work to reassure them that our product is safe. And actually, this is why also we've chosen the technologies we've chosen, um, because we believe that inherently they're the safest. Um, the other thing is, I always say if we we should think about it as if we were launching a traditional bacon, what would we do differently? Um, so how would we stand out? And so all things similar, how do we stand out? And that's where now we're doing um, some work on thousands on of consumers to understand more deeply um, what is it that we can do. So I'll have a better answer in a, in a couple of months. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting challenge with lots of deep tech companies because I think you know, your investors, uh, yourself, your team, especially on the scientific side, are all really excited about the technology. They're all excited about this this change in, you know, in, in your case, in, in, in um, you know, biotechnology and, and with breakthroughs in bioreactors that we can now cultivate meat. But most people, and this is you know, true of, of me as well, what we want is tasty meat. We want affordable meat. We want um, meat, which we you know, hopefully has a, a negligible or, or, or positive impact, even possibly on the planet. And um, you know, it may be uh, that that's the thing that you have to sell to people, rather than the fact it's cultivated, rather than it comes from a traditional pig. Definitely, and we're working as well on different angles. Um, you know, f- from whether it's more making bacon more creative. Um, so one of the things, actually, I, I hope is that 
today buying meat is is not fun. It's kind of the brands are really boring. Um, so actually you make a brand that's a lot more fun. Um, so that's some, something that we're working on. We're looking at the actual benefits that the bacon brings and that is immediate. So ideally something that would be an immediate uh, reward reward um for the people buying it so um we're looking at different angles again um some some work in the in in the pipeline benjamin the theme of this podcast is what's next we've spoken a lot about you know uncommon's first focus which is uh, cultivated meat and pork in particular um, but as you mentioned at the beginning the technologies you're working with have a much broader array of potential applications so if you dream about what's a bit further down the line for the company what else do you think you might be working on in five or 10 years time? So what we see as, as some of the other applications is try and make um, therapeutics as well more affordable. We're not looking to do that on our own, um, but what we are looking is to partner um, with others and we're in discussions with some of the big uh, pharma companies on maybe using our delivery method for RNA therapeutics, um, as well as potentially using some of the liquids that we use to culture our cells um, in in IPS therapies. So there's a lot of different applications that we're envisaging and looking at collaborating with people on. I, and you mentioned RNA there. So, so many people listening will know what that is, but maybe you could just explain that in a little bit more detail for people who don't. Yeah, so, I mean, we work with messenger RNA, so a particular type of RNA, um, and it does exactly what the name says, so it's a messenger, so it tells your cells um, what to do, and the applications of it can can be broad, so you can have um, cancer um, therapies, but also um, more broadly known, the, va- the vaccines um, during COVID, for example. And is that a area you thought when you started off on this journey you would have an impact on? I think so. So I think that's probably one of the things we did differently than other founders is we always we always thought about it. And so when we patented a work, we always made sure to cover um, therapeutics in it and, and make it in, in a way where we could uh, leverage it. And that's because I came into the business really with wanting to have a maximum of impact on people's health. Um, so I didn't come to um, to necessarily make an impact on animals. I think it's it's a great thing that we do. Um, but for me, it's really around human health and do doing a maximum that we can for that. Mm. Well, look, Benjamina, thank you so much for making time with us today. You know, I think about, I really enjoy working with you for a number of reasons. And this conversation has reminded me of those, you know, partly because of the scale of what you're working on, you know, thinking through from first principles, how do I have an impact on human health and working back all the way through to, I'm going to start with pork is not necessarily how most people think, but I think the, you know, the brilliance of your approach and your way of thinking has meant that you are working on a tractable problem today, which hopefully will end up in many different huge solutions going forward. So that's great and enjoyable and fun. Um, But you're also, I think, incredibly honest and open about the challenges of building a technology business, a deep technology business in a field which is so important to us, right? Food and more broadly, human health. And there are many challenges that come with doing that beyond, as you've mentioned, the science, the supply chain issues, the regulatory issues, how you convince people who may uh, be pessimistic or, or, or even unclear about what you're building um, and bring people on that journey. Uh, so thank you for spending time on that thank today. You. Uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. And we've really enjoyed having you on What's Next. Thank you. Thank you.